And now we're talking about balance. The reason we're talking about balance is because it is a major issue. The devil can't keep you out of warfare. He gets you really into warfare. If you get, if you see people who are really into it and imbalanced, then you probably don't want anything to do with it. We've talked about the fact that it's a wrong focus, meaning that when in doubt, meet need. Make sure your warfare brings a result, meets the needs of humans, rather than serves a methodology, serves a theology that you've cooked up about how this all operates. And that, and I say that strongly and seriously because that is, an, that is a now issue as I travel everywhere. People are serving their methodology, they're serving their knowledge in this thing, and they're not necessarily meeting the needs of people. Not necessarily edifying the body with it. It's, it's serving what I know. I'm going to serve what I know rather than serve people and serve need. The difference between mysticism and ministry the difference between mysticism and ministry is A, is it biblical? And B, do people get their needs met? The difference between mysticism and ministry is A, is it biblical? And B, do people get their needs met? And when you deal... what? Why has a lot of the church shut down the possibility of the supernatural? They don't believe in spiritual gifts. They don't believe in God talking to people. They don't believe in, in all of this stuff. I'll tell you why. It's because it's risky. It's risky. And the risk is mysticism. I know something. God showed me something. God told me something. I know something about you. And it's totally impractical. And that's why a lot of the body said, we just don't want to mess with this. It's just chaotic. Now, we need this because we're dealing with a spirit enemy. We need this because in order to meet your needs, I've got to have supernatural power and wisdom. But I need to go ahead and not just, and not just glory in the process of it. I need to go ahead and, meet, and minister to you rather than just be a mystic. All right, now, if we are not to overemphasize or underemphasize, how can we bring balance into this thing? These people over here assume demon. These people over here are reluctant to acknowledge demon. One assumes demon, the other one is reluctant to acknowledge demon. Now, if I'm not to just assume demon... Don't assume it's demonic. Don't be reluctant to acknowledge that it's demonic. So how are we going to be in balance? Would you believe they fly me all over the world to tell people to ask God? Don't assume it's demonic. See that? I've seen these things for 30 years, and that is always demonic. No, it's not. Let me give you an example. One time I, I, when I was leading schools over in Hawaii, I had two brothers come to the school, in the same school, who were epileptic. Because they were going to be in this atmosphere of worship and teaching and so on, 24 hours a day, they decided to step out in faith, unquote, and go off their medication. How many of you know what happened? Isn't it interesting we all know what happened? I haven't even told you yet, and you know. What happened? Come on, what happened? They had seizures, that's true. And in both cases, it was in class. And I, in both cases, I was standing at the front of the class. Now, my epileptic seizure is a unpleasant, awkward experience when experienced publicly because one loses their, the control of their faculty. And a lot of us don't know what to do with awkward moments in a public setting. So it was just like it was just like a lecture. It was just like an illustration for this particular lecture. It was like drawing a line down the middle of that class. Half the people, in their awkwardness of the moment, tipped over chairs trying to get to this guy and leaped on him. The other half of the class were horrified that somebody would jump on a man having a seizure and go.
Now, it would be interesting if something like that happened in this room this morning. We would find out which side of the ledger you were on. So don't assume. Now, was, was epilepsy demonic in the scripture? Yes. Is all epilepsy demonic? No. Can you, can you smoke cigarettes and be, and be, uh, demonized? Yes. Is all cigarette smokers got demon? No. Has cancer been demonic? Is all cancer demonic? No. Has sickness been demonic? Is all sickness demonic? No, unless, you, unless you're thinking of it in the indirect sense that sickness entered when we opened ourselves to the enemy in the, in the garden. You see the balance we need, folks? How are you going to know? Ask the Lord. No matter how much experience you've had, no matter how many years you've been doing this, no matter how much, whether you do spiritual warfare concentratedly every day, still say, God, what is it this time? What is the methodology this time? Lord, we've got to hear from you. This is called praying in the Spirit. Let the Lord lead you every time differently if He wants to. Okay, now, when God talks to you, He's going to talk to you in combinations. So look for combinations. Look for combinations. You see, part of our problem of imbalance is we say, is this demonic or isn't it demonic? We want to know, is it or isn't it? And we miss the point that it's partially demonic. There's a demonic element, but there are el other elements, so we must look for combinations. What I find Christians want to know is who can have a demon, who does have a demon. Do you think this is demonic, brother, or do you think this is just life? Well, it's a hard question to answer because in actual fact, it's a combination of things. Let me give you an example. The, the, one of the best illustrations of this is alcoholism. For years, we had this fight, see, where the humanistic element... The liberal element in Christianity said alcoholism is a disease. Evangelical born-again people said it's not a disease, it's a sin. You repent of that, you turn from it, God will set you free. Then we went another step and we got the charismatic Pentecostal variety coming in there saying just lay hands on that sucker, cast something out of him, he'll never want another drink. Now, we've been arguing about this for years. Are you mature enough to accept the fact it may be all three? It may be a disease. There may even be a propensity to it, psychologically and physically. I'm willing to accept that. But it's still a sin from which, it needs to, for, from which you need to repent, and you are responsible for the choices involved, even if it is a disease. See, that's the, that's the balance. And it may be demonic. But to assume it's always demonic is wrong. And to assume that it's only a disease and you just got to suffer it out and walk through the 12 steps or whatever is also an imbalance. So look for combinations. Another example, somebody raised their hand in a seminar like this and said, you know, we ministered deliverance to this woman and she still went back to therapy. Now see, that's an imbalance because just because you've been delivered doesn't mean you may not still need some therapy. Right? Well, I can see you're struggling, but it's true anyway. See? Be careful when you say, well, a lot of people are in the church are dependent on this humanistic psychology. Make, make sure you make the distinction between humanistic psychology and psychology. Psychology is not a naughty word, folks. Psychology is the study of the human personality. 
And that is a bona fide science. It's okay to study how the personality functions. And it's okay to be skilled to be able to put the, put the messed up personality back together. Now, what makes it wrong is when you only function in that from a humanistic worldview and philosophy. But given the fact that you understand a biblical worldview, then you can work in combination in this thing. So we got preachers getting up, writing books, making sermons about all psychology is of the devil. We don't need it. We just slap hands on people and they're okay. No, they're not in many cases. Sometimes they are and we have testimonies of that. Is that true? I know people have been freed from heroin in one hit of prayer. I know other people who went cold turkey and took a long time. I know some people who were freed from this particular problem at the front of the meeting in the name of Jesus. I know other people who had to walk this thing through and rebuild their personality. Look for combination. There's a demonic element. This, this group over here doesn't even look for the demonic element. They just want to do psychology. They just want you to take herbs and you'll be fine. But the people on the other side say, it's all demonic, get the demons out of there, you'll be fine. No, you won't. You still need some help. You still need to eat right. You still need to forgive your sister. Is that right? So there's a human choice element. The human choice involves, are you willing to be free? Are you willing to be a non-problem? Some people aren't willing. If I get free, I won't ever be prayed for or counseled again. And I won't get attention. And they don't want it. So there's a choice involved. The choice also involves repentance. Are you willing to forsake this? Well, no, actually, I like the identity of being a was-a. I was-a. Before I was a Christian, I was-a. And that's their identity till their dying day. And some of them won't repent to forsake that thing. They want to be a was-a because it's all they are. Because they haven't seen who they are in Christ. Or they're not excited about who they are in Christ. They're more excited about being a waza. So, will you repent? Are you sorry enough to quit this thing? And there needs to be a choice of faith. Do you believe what Jesus Christ did on the cross is enough for you? Well, I don't know, boy. I'm in pretty bad shape. <laughs> hey, if you don't believe that Jesus, death on the cross, can deal with whatever ails you, you're out of faith. So there's choice involved, choice to be willi to, willing to be free, choice to repent, and choice to believe. Will you believe? Do you believe? I am able to do this, Jesus said to the man. Do you believe? Make a choice, sir. I know I'm the son of God and the creator of the world here, but make a choice here. Do you believe I am able to do this? Oh, Lord, I believe. Help my propensity not to. <laughs> but I choose to believe. Okay, there is a human weakness element. We have weaknesses, folks. I wear glasses. It is not a demon. It's not even lack of faith. There are weaknesses in the human family. Some people live to be 92. Some people live to be 42. Is that right? We have death process working in us and God repairs that process in a thing called healing but no matter how many times He repairs you unless you go up with Christ when He comes you're going to go out in a coffin. Sorry to tell you that but that's the way it is. And so when you minister to get rid of the demonic you should also minister a build up of faith of who they are and what God has done and you should also repair the damage through healing. Let me say that again. Don't ever minister deliverance without ministering a buildup of faith of who they are in Christ and without ministering healing to the damage in their personality. Otherwise, they will be vulnerable again. Heal and build up the wall. So, look for combinations. Choice, the choice element, the human weakness element, 
the environmental element, the physical element. Hey, some people don't have demons. They just need vitamins. They got a chemical imbalance. It's not a demon. Are you... <laughs> I, I love speaking to audiences because you just, you know, sometimes it's like you drop something down a great big black hole and you don't hear it hit, you know. <laughs> Come on, folks. Sometimes people are in serious depression and they can take some kind of a chemical that, that puts the chemical balance together in their bodies and they're fine. And it had nothing to do with demonic even though it looked like a tremendous oppression of the devil. And it wasn't. They had a chemical imbalance. Are you mature enough to handle this? Now, does that mean don't pray for them? Of course you should pray for them. But sometimes, you see, God, I, I can't pray to cover my nakedness. I put clothes on. I can't pray to fill my stomach. I go eat lunch. So there are some things that God just says, well, hey, I have... Put a, you know, there's something available to you here. Eat right. We had, we had a girl that went paralyzed in one of our schools. She could not walk. She was numb from the waist down. We didn't know whether she was going to be paralyzed forever. We didn't know whether it was multiple sclerosis or whatever it was. Students came in, had words of the Lord, rebuked demons, prayed for healing, told her to get up and walk by faith. She couldn't. She fell down. I mean, it was just a mess. Leader of the school came in, said, Lord, why is Debbie paralyzed? God gave him a word of knowledge. He said, what have you been eating? She'd been eating junk food only. He said, I'm not going to pray for you. I'm not going to rebuke demons. Go eat right. She did. She wasn't paralyzed. She walked. She's fine. Okay? That's maturity, folks. Look for combination. Now, if you're over here, of course, you're liking what I'm saying right now because you say, well, I knew it wasn't demons all along. No. You're going to miss you're going to miss the fact that it is demonic. And see, sometimes you got a combination here where it is a chemical imbalance, but the devil is also messing with you because he's taking advantage of your weakness. So you got to cut off the enemy and take your pill too. Don't go one way or the other on me now, but keep with combination. Deal with the de demonic because it's often there. Satan is a bully. And he beats up on your physical, emotional, environmental weaknesses. You've got to deal with him and rebuke him and cast him away. By the way, the, the verse that says cast out demons can be just as easily trans, translated cast away. Sometimes they come out, sometimes they go away. Both biblical translations are both accurate translations of the Greek language. And Jesus said, go to every creature. And he said, go to every nation. So casting out demons is not just out of creatures, it's out of corporate structure. How about that? All right. We know that because when he gets over to Ephesians 6, he says, every Christian is war warring. Every Christian is struggling against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. That sounds like personal demons to me. And rulers and authorities and world forces of darkness, which is more corporate stuff, isn't it? All right, you just want to be balanced on all this. Look for combinations, all right? Let me give you another balance. Be aware, but never impressed. Be aware, but never impressed. Now, the people on this, this side over here are unaware. The people on this side are what? Impressed. They're sucking all the oxygen out of the room. <gasps> you wouldn't believe how deep. They have this little song they sing about Satan's function in the earth. Deep and wide, deep. and They just, it's so deep. It's so heavy. It's so wide. It's been there so long. It's, you got no idea. You come to our city, brother, you don't realize how deep this thing is, how concentrated it is. Now, the people on this side, they make fun of that and say, ah, it's nothing, Jesus died, praise God, we can take Vancouver in an afternoon. Well, 
Both people are naive, folks. You can't take Vancouver in the afternoon, and it is very deep and wide, but don't be impressed with it because God is bigger even than Vancouver. Amen? So the key is know what the devil's doing, treat it seriously, get all the details, collect the data, just don't be impressed with it. Now, what's the picture of this? The picture is Numbers 13. That's a book in the Bible. <laughs> Numbers 13 where Moses sent the 12 spies into the promised land. Remember that? What did they do? They didn't just find out where to build the condominiums and where, where the grapes grew bigger. They went in and they surveyed the strongholds of the enemy. Is it biblical to survey the strongholds of the enemy? Evidently. Some people have a problem with this. Here it is. It is biblical to send spies in and in a detailed way figure out how the enemy is arrayed and where he is functioning. And when they gave the report, they said, over here is these guys, and in this area is these guys, and the Anakim live in Hebron. So it's okay to do spiritual mapping and find out where the enemy is functioning. But the problem with this is when they came out, they gave a true report. It was accurate. It wasn't exaggerated. It wasn't underestimated. It was good and right for them to report like this. But ten of these spies did not include God in their report. They were impressed with their data, which doesn't mean they shouldn't have gotten the data. It simply means that they should have included God in the data. Joshua and Caleb said everything they said is the truth. All of those beings really are there. The giants really are there. The cities are heavily fortified. That's a true report. But our God is so big and so strong and so willing that they are bred for us. We are well able to go up and take these cities. So your tendency, folks, is to, to not investigate at all because you're going to be overwhelmed when you get investigating. And you know people who are investigating all of these places and all of what went on here years ago and all of what's going on over there and what the prince power of this is and who's the big demon over here. And you see them getting overwhelmed and pushed down and down and down. So you don't want any part of it. You just want to rejoice in Jesus. Be balanced. And the way to be balanced and biblical, I think, is to know what the devil's doing just don't be impressed with what the devil's doing. And the way you don't get impressed with what the devil's doing is you get impressed with God. Listen, folks, one of the reasons we come into buildings like this every time the doors are open is because we need to be impressed with God. One of the reasons we worship in this place is because worship is a form of being impressed with God. God, you're great. God, you're wonderful. Jesus, you died. You broke the power of the enemy. Hallelujah. We trust you. You love us. You're in us. We're new creatures. We celebrate that stuff and we must because it gives us the right kind of impression. Now, when you get impressed with what the devil does, it is a form of worship. Let me demonstrate. Worship kind of works like this. I come over here and I say, Oh God, you are so good, so faithful, so powerful, so active in my life. I love you, Jesus. That's worship, in case you didn't recognize it. Okay, now, I come over here. I hear people getting their heads cut off with a shovel. I hear about all these horror things, ugly, obscene, people molesting their own children, people... Ethnic cleansing in Bosnia, I hear of concentration camps and people getting skinned alive, and I hear of all kinds of hideous, ob ugly, obscene, grotesque, bizarre, murderous, rape stuff, and I go, yeah. <gasps> oh, yuck, oh, you wouldn't believe what's going on, are right. you? Oh, you wouldn't believe. See, and I'm, I'm having the same emotions elicited from me by the ugly that I had elicited from me by the beautiful. 
See that? We worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We go, oh God, you're so wonderful. Over here we go, oh yuck, you're so wicked. And it's a form of worship. So how do I refrain from this? Pretend the devil isn't there, as some tell you. Just worship and everything will be okay? No. Investigate? No. Be aware? Just don't be impressed with what you investigate. You get it? And the way not to is to be impressed with God and to spend lots of time meditating in His Word and muttering to yourself the truth Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, make, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, and always giving thanks in all things. Hallelujah, Lord. You're bigger than this. Hallelujah, Lord. You're stronger than this. Hallelujah, Lord. This is nothing for you. Thank you, Jesus. Every time you see something grotesque, say, praise God. The beauty of God can swallow up this thing. Don't not investigate. That doesn't help God out. But in your investigation, include the greatness of God in the report. Are you with me on this? Because this is an issue across the planet. Some people are investigating, they're getting under it. So people say, the key is don't investigate. Just worship. Some people are just worshiping, they're not investigating, and they hope everything's going to be all right. It isn't. There are still major sections of cities, nations that aren't reached yet, and we need to cut into it, and warfare is one of the ways. All right, so be aware, but don't be impressed. All right, let me give you another little thing here called the nature of attack as a part of balance. The nature of attack. The nature of attack. People are confused about this. And I get questions on it everywhere. Now, brother, isn't it true if you go into this particular area or if you try to deal with this, something bad's going to happen to you? Because I know this person. And I, got, I got even pastors who come to me saying, brother, I don't think it is wise to send young people over there. And he mentions a particular country. So I come back to him and I said, okay, I want to take your advice. How young? I mean, see, we, we, we leave ourselves in ambiguity and you're not in faith when you're in ambiguity. So when you just say, I don't think it's right to send young people over here, but you haven't told me how young. And you haven't told me why over there and why they could go here. Other than the fact that I'm assuming that the devil can get them here, but he can't get them there. And see, we're confused. Can the devil get you in that country easier than he can get you in this country? What causes the devil to be able to get you or not get you? That's the question. Going to this country or not going to this country? And see, people in, in Canada and the United States and places like that are always, the bigger demons are always over there. Oh, you need a real call to go over there. That's where the real demons live. <laughs> see, wrong. this is ambiguous, ambiguous stuff, folks. So we need to know some balance on this. What is the nature of attack? Okay? Number one, nature of attack is everybody is attacked. Now this is a surprise to some people. Everybody comes under the attack of the enemy. Or probably a better word here would be the attempts of the enemy. I'm not saying you get possessed. I'm not saying the devil can come and beat up on you just because he decides to, but he can attack you. You have been attacked, you will be attacked, you are being attacked probably. But the problem is, some of you are wondering, does this mean there's something deficient about my Christianity? How can I come under attack? Because you live on planet Earth, and your Bible says, be strong, take armor, because we wrestle. See? Well, there really isn't any more warfare, Dean, because Jesus bound the devil at the cross and it's all over. Then why is Ephesians 6 saying, be strong, take armor, because you wrestle. You struggle. Not to get saved, not to keep saved, but because you are in a 
combat with a demonic world. And it is called wrestling, struggling. There is an attack of the enemy. And everybody has it. Wake up. It is true. Even though Jesus defeated completely every demonic force at the cross, there is still a wrestling after the cross, according to the scripture. Now, this wrestling is not to try to defeat the devil like Jesus did at the, at the cross, and it's not trying to keep the devil off your back. It is simply fending off his attempts and his attack. Now, why would the devil bother to attack you since he knows he's defeated and he knows you should know it? Because he finds out you're not sure of it. So, the devil intends you to give in. Why does the devil bother to attack you? I'll tell you why. Because he's found out something about you. You're not really sure how this works. And so you think, well, this must be because of all the things I did before I was a Christian. This must mean because even though I'm saved that I don't have strength against this thing. And you've got to expect that when you're in the ministry that I'm in, it's going to happen. You see that? The devil attacks you to play on your ignorance. To see whether or not you will allow this. You know why he bothers? Because hundreds of Christians do allow it. Well, there's nothing we can do. I mean, the devil's just been messing with us. And you know, you got to take the bad with the good, which is Eastern thought. <laughs> what goes around comes around. Bad karma and good karma. No, that's not Christian. You don't have to take the good with the bad. You rebuke the bad. You stand against it. You refuse it. But the devil has found that you'll take a certain amount, so he gives it to you. He's a super salesman and he will sell it to you. You hear me? The devil attacks you because he's found out he can. The devil plays on your ignorance. He figures out what works. He goes, huh? and you go, ah, and he goes, oh, look at this, it works. And he continues to do that for 30 years if you let him. Understand? It's the way it works, folks. If you're, a, if you're a passive Christian and I'm the devil, I will beat up on you. If I find you are a Christian who has never re resisted the devil, I will mess with you continually. And the only thing that will stop me is when you resist me. That's why every believer is told in the Scripture, resist the devil and he will flee from you. James 4, 7. 1 Peter 5, 9. Resist him firm in your faith. 1 Peter 5, 9. Resist him firm in your faith. Or I like to say it like this. Convince him you're convinced. See, write it down, folks. The devil doesn't stop doing things automatically. He only stops doing them when Christians tell him to. In Jesus' name. The devil doesn't stop doing things automatically. He only stops doing things when Christians tell him to in the name of Jesus. Devil, in Jesus' name, stop this. And then he tries it four more times to see if you really believe this or it just sounded good when the guy taught it. So here's the, here it is, folks. Write it down. You have to convince him you're convinced. Because you're not dealing with a principle. You're dealing with a personality. So you can't just say, I rebuke the devil. Okay, that's taken care of. No, he is a personality and he's a great bluffer. And he knows he has to leave, but he's found out you don't think he has to leave. So you can't ever say, I resist the devil, I think. I hope, probably, maybe. Oh no, it's not working. Oh, I must not be, I must not be a Christian long enough. Oh, maybe it's because of the bad thoughts I had this morning. Maybe, oh, maybe I need two people. Oh, I might need the pastor to pray for me. See? And that is not firm in your faith. And the devil knows that. He knows you have authority over it. But he's found out you don't know that. So he messes with you and you say, I rebuke you. I think, oh no, it's not working. That's because you're not firm in your faith.
So what do you got to do? You got to convince him you're convinced. Devil, stop messing with my daughter. In the name of Jesus, I cut you off. And I'll be standing here 50 years from now if I have to. You're going to quit. And once you've convinced him, you're convinced, he quits. He does not quit because you used a gruff voice. I recognize the name of Jesus. Not impressed. What impresses him is convince him you're convinced. Or to put it in biblical language, resist him firm in your faith. So why does the devil attack people and bother even though he knows he's defeated? Is because hundreds allow him and he knows it. Hundreds don't know their authority and don't and wonder why God even let this happen in the first place and get mad at God and he knows it. But you got to understand the nature of attack is everybody's attack. The nature of attack is the devil hopes you'll give up. All right, nature attack number three. Check the windows. If I come to your house in Canada in the winter and I feel a draft, what do we know? What do we know? Something's open. What are we going to do? Come on, talk to me. Close it. Is this hard theology? Folks, just close it. And if you're under continual harassment from the enemy, year after year, week after week, you're resisting the enemy, it's not going away, check the window. If you're feeling a draft, it could be that something's open. You could be moving in pride. You could be moving in independence. You could be, you could be leaving. There might be some unforgiveness in your life that you've harbored all of these years. And that's why the devil can continually beat up on you is because there's an open window. Now listen carefully, folks. I'm not saying all attack comes because there's sin in your life. I've already used number one to say you can be attacked anyway, even if there's nothing wrong. But if it's continuous and concentrated, you need to at least check and get honest. And by the way, it's good to pray with somebody else because we, we deceive ourselves. A heart is desperately wicked and deceitful and you often cannot see your pride. And pride is often the last thing we actually deal with. Because we're not going out and doing overt sinning, we don't think there's something open, but we're moving in a, in a hideous pride and independence. Even spiritual pride. Here I am, I'm not going out and getting drunk, I don't take drugs, I'm not murdering anybody, I'm not immoral, but I'm in hideous spiritual pride, and I'm in, but I'm in ministry every day helping people, and so I think I'm all right. And yet the devil is beating up on me, and I go, how could this be happening? I pray 24 hours a day. It's because I'm moving in pride about the fact that I pray 24 hours a day, but I can't see that. See. So pray with somebody else. Check the windows, folks. Don't assume you're under attack because something's wrong with you because that's not always the case. Job was under attack, and it wasn't because something was wrong with him. It was because the devil is allowed to attack us. That's what we learned from the book of Job. But check the windows. Number four, what's God's intention? God intends, by allowing this, that you develop spiritual muscle and... Well, we won't... God's, God allows you to be attacked because He wants you to learn to throw it off and develop spiritual muscle. God allows you to have an opponent because He wants you to learn to throw it off. And if you sit and say, God, how come have you allowed this? Do something. He said, no, I want you to do something. I want you to throw this off and to develop spiritual muscle. God allows you to have an opponent. In other words, folks, you can make all kinds of goals if you're the only team on the ice. But that's not a lot of fun. Is that right? And you actually appreciate an opponent. Is that true? 
If you're the only team on the floor, you can just make baskets or goals or touchdowns all day. Right? But that's not fun. You don't even want that. You actually prefer to have an opponent. If I go to the Olympic Games and I climb up on the dais there where it says one, two, three, and I say, I'm the wrestling champion of the whole world, you're not impressed and I'm not satisfied. But if I take on every wrestler in my weight class from every country in the world and I pin their back to the mat over a period of days and then I get up on the one and say I'm the wrestling champion of the world, you're impressed. And I'm really deeply satisfied. So God allows you to have an opponent so that, you, so that in overcoming the opponent, you're satisfied. You see that? How can you be an overcomer if you've never overcome anything? And Christians don't understand this. They just say, I don't understand. How come God's allowing me to have an opponent here? Somebody bumped into me when I was playing hockey. Well, the reason you're giggling is because that sounds stupid. Of course they ran into you. That's the way it is. And God allows you to have an opponent. Why? Just so you can be beat up? No. So you can overcome this opponent in the name of Jesus. So you can lean into his grace and you can lean into his power and you can say, Hallelujah, Lord, we overcame this thing. Your power was manifest. Your glory was shown by overcoming this opponent. I learned to depend upon you. I learned to channel your power. This is great, God. I'm not just sitting in school. I'm actually in the game. I'm not just a spectator of Christianity. I actually can engage the opponent and come out the other side a winner. We all want victory, folks, but we don't want to ever get engaged in the opponent. That's crazy. There's no way that can happen. So God wants to glorify Himself in the midst of battle and to teach you how to draw from His grace and power in the midst of the situation. God intends for you to develop spiritual muscles. That's why he allows the attack. And number five, don't let the attack have its ultimate effect. Or is it effect? Anyway, you use the right one in your notes. Don't let this thing have its ultimate effect. Now, the picture here is Job. Job was under the attack of the enemy. He did lose camels. He did lose donkeys. He did lose kids. He did get boils. Was this a defeat? No, because he didn't allow the attack to have its ultimate effect. There will be times in your Christian life and times in your ministry when you do incur difficulty when you do attend funerals that you don't want to attend, when you do go through things financially that you would prefer not to go through, you will come under attack. Things will go wrong. The key is don't stop in the middle of this thing. Don't say, why God? Don't say, I don't can't handle it anymore. Stay in there and don't let it have its ultimate effect on you. You're sitting in the funeral. You're overcome by grief. I don't have cute answers about God taking your loved one or the devil killing your loved one. That's too simple. I don't even know. I think we should press into God and say, give me understanding, and sometimes he does, and that's a great healing to us. Other times we don't have understanding, but one, one thing we can determine. I'm not going to let this thing have its ultimate effect on me that the enemy wants. Or the way we say it in Christian circles, don't let the devil get glory out of this thing. Make sure God gets glory. That's the same thing. Don't let it have its ultimate effect on you. The devil tries to wear you down, you see, because he knows a lot of people have turned and cursed God like Job's wife suggested. If God was any kind of a God, this kind of stuff wouldn't happen to us. How can you serve a God who lets this stuff happen? There are people walking the streets of Vancouver who used to go to church, folks, that are doing that very thing. I'll tell you why I don't go to church anymore. How can, how can you serve a God that lets this happen? 
How can God be any kind of a God and do that? If Christianity is so hot, how come all those preachers are going to bed with their secretary? We let the attack have its ultimate effect on us. Okay? Just don't let it have its ultimate effect. It's part of warfare. Say, hey, I don't understand what's going on here. Job didn't blame God and didn't blame himself. His friends came and said, I don't know, Job, something's wrong here. These things don't happen to people living right. Job did not blame others. That's my point here. And he didn't blame himself, and he didn't blame God, and he won the victory. The book of Job is a book of ultimate victory. He got back twice what he lost because he didn't break down in the middle of the attack. So everybody can be attacked. Now, one more thing that I missed up here, should have been number two. There are people, places, and times when the attack is greater. This is a truism, folks. Some people come under a greater attack than you do. Billy Graham has attacks you've never heard of. Is, would, would you agree with that? Pastors have and leaders have attacks that others don't have. Do you, do you agree with that? Yes. Yes, because certain people are influential. Jimmy Swaggart preached to more people than any other preacher in history. Did you know that? The devil did. He had influence on more people than Billy Graham, than the Apostle Paul. I'm not here to make a big deal or a little deal of Jimmy Swaggart. I just want you to know that there are people in the world who have greater influence, presidents and prime ministers and pastors and husbands and, you know, and so the enemy attacks different people stronger than other people. If I got the pastor, I got the congregation in a lot of cases. If I can convince the pastor Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he can convince the congregation. So I'm going to go after the pastor. That makes sense. So yes, there are people who have a greater attack than you. Are there places where the attack is stronger? Yes. It's stronger in this area, it's stronger in that country, it's stronger here. That's true. That's not imagined, that's true. It's a heavy oppression over there. Heavier than where you live. Yes. Are there times in your life when the attack is more acute than others? Take the full armor of God so that you might be able to stand in the evil day. Yeah. Yeah. The Ephesians knew all about this. They knew there were bad days and good days, that there were heavier attack days and less attack days. Everybody in the occult knows that. Every native Canadian knows that. There are seasons and times when the attack is more intense, and the Bible bears this out. Take the armor that you might be able to stand even in the evil day. Even in the season of heavier attack, you can stand. That's what it says. Okay, so it is true that people, places, and times have a greater attack. Here's my answer to that. If you have a good roof on your house, it doesn't matter whether it's a sprinkle or a torrent, you're still dry. Do you get it? If you have a good roof on your house, it doesn't matter whether it's just a sprinkle, a mist, a Vancouver mist, or whether it is a raging torrent of rain, you still are dry. In other words, folks, know the truth that it's heavier electricity over here than it is here. I can work on the little wires that come out of the wall. It's 110 volts. Or I can work on the, wall, the lines that come across from the hydroelectric plant. The point is, if the power's off, I'm okay in both cases. The issue is, I need to be a lot more careful that it's off over here than I do over here, because this is a heavier attack, and if I'm wrong here, I'm made into a french fry. You understand? But if the power's off, doesn't matter which line you're dealing with. If you got a good roof on your house, doesn't matter how 
torrential the rain is, you're still dry. If you're in Christ, if you're seated with him in heavenly places, as long as you're acknowledging we're into serious stuff here, but hallelujah, Jesus is greater. We can handle it because we have armor on. We can handle it if we walk circumspectly and wisely before the Lord and don't step out of line. Now I say that to you because lots of people think that in certain conditions, the devil comes to him and said, you shouldn't have come here. You shouldn't have entered this intercession ministry because now I can mess with you. And they go, oh, I guess so. I should never come to this town in the first place because there's a heavier oppression here and I'm not ready for it. That's a lie. You are ready for it, but you need to know that. 